Now that we have got a firm grasp on our project, what it needs to do, who we're building it for, why we're building it, those types of questions, now it's time to gather the requirements. Sometimes people just jump into gathering requirements. That's fine as long as you ask those questions that we've covered before we start this. Because as you're getting into gathering the requirements, you'll start getting details. You're like, what? What? Why are you doing that? And if you don't have that general overview information, you won't have a good context to base all that information on. Now this step of the process in the software development life cycle is just important as the first and the subsequent steps. All of these steps are very important. Okay, I will be using the work order system that I've been building for a garage as an example to gather these requirements. I wanted to use a project that hopefully you guys are very familiar with. Perhaps you've been following me along as I've been building that application. You notice as I started building the application, even as I was going along building out each screen, there was a document that I kept referencing going back and forth to. The human brain a lot of times just can't hold all that information unless you have a photographic memory. You're really good at that. I don't think most people are, and I would put myself in that group of people. <laughs> so you want these things written down. You want them documented. You just don't want to have a meeting. People say things. Even if you record the meeting, you need to write these things down, put them into a, a document. You send back to the people that you talk to and say, hey, this is what we went over. This is what I documented. Is all this correct? Is there anything that needs to be added, edited, or removed? Very important. So allow me to tell you about the work order system I'm building for a garage. What I have found key in gathering requirements for a future project is you identify the entities that your system will need to work with. Identifying and defining those entities is of the utmost importance when gathering requirements. What is an entity? Well, let's use an example and I'll show you exactly what I mean. As I read off this paragraph of information about the garage work order system, identify the nouns. Now, a noun is a person, place, a thing, or idea. The completion of jobs on cars in a garage business. Customers come to the service center or garage needing work, smog inspection, oil change, AC service, etc., done on their vehicles. So let's identify all the entities that were mentioned right there. Paying close attention to any usage of nouns. So the first thing that was identified was jobs or work. That's important if you're building a work order system. This app will manage the completion of jobs on cars. Let's put down here vehicles or cars. I don't want to exclude things like vans and trucks. Okay, we also have customers. We mentioned customers. All right, so vehicles. This app will manage the completion of jobs on cars in a garage business. Customers come to the service center. So we do have customers here. Customers come to the service center or garage needing work, work or jobs done on their vehicles. All right, let's go to more details. See if we can identify any more entities that our system will need to manage. Customers will interact with office admin staff. So staff, their employees. All right, so we've got employees here. Office admin staff will enter details of the customers and their vehicles. So we're talking about employees, customers, vehicles, and then assign jobs to technicians who are again our employees, different type of employee. Now you might want to say, okay, well, I've got office admin and I've got technicians. Well, if you've been following my application, I keep both types of employees table or list. So any entity could have a category. So that would just simply be a column within the table, within the list that will identify those different types. So I'm not gonna split those out. So I'm gonna keep things as simple as possible as you can here. And as we move along, as we identify something, the much more complexity between different types. It's at that point where you might wanna ask yourself, oh, are these really two different types of entities? If you're writing an application that keeps track of employees and then you have physicians that you need to track, but physicians have a ton more information that you need to keep track of, you either need to split that on into a different entity type or some type of one-on-one -on -one relationship. We'll talk about relationships a little bit later. But I just wanted to touch on that. Sometimes there's a temptation to break out entities even further and you just don't need to do that at this stage of gathering requirements unless it becomes really obvious, okay? But at this point, we're gonna keep this as one entity employees. So office admin will enter details of the customers and their vehicles and then assign jobs to individual technicians <laughs> who perform the work on the vehicles. Technicians. Technician users will use a kiosk computer. Is our system gonna keep track of computer hardware? Is that a part of the requirements? Probably not. It could if you're writing a 
IT type of system, a work order system where you need to manage computer assets in the office, then yeah. that actually would qualify as something your system need to manage. But this software system that we're going to build in Power App is going to manage these things. It's not going to manage computers, okay? So technicians will use the kiosk computer in the garage. A garage is actually a noun. However, our system isn't going to manage a bunch of garages. The system will be installed in a garage that will manage all these things. Hopefully you see the distinction. Hey, if you're getting anything helpful out of this, a comment or even a like really helps the channel and that's people like you know this is good content. Much appreciated. So technicians will use a kiosk computer in the garage to find out what work has been assigned to them and what they've already completed for the day. Technicians can print off what they need Bye. job through a small POS or point of sale printer attached to their kiosk. So users will interact with the system. So we're talking about employees here. Customers come into the garage to have work done. Vehicles have work done on them. Job types, different categories of work to be done on the vehicles. Now, this is where we're gonna start breaking things down. The different types of jobs that are gonna be completed on vehicles, there's different types of jobs. In a job, we could have a, a type of job being done on a vehicle. So is that an oil change? Is it a tire rotation? Well, those are two completely different types of jobs. And you might have one employee that does oil changes only and another employee that specializes in dealing with tires on vehicles. So we might actually want to know that. So regarding orders. Okay. Well, this is a new, a new entity, an order. Customers place an order of one or more jobs. Okay. So looking at all these things, orders, where does this fit? Well, you might think, oh, that's jobs. Well, not so fast. A job is a piece of work done on a vehicle. So we just talked about job type, oil change, tire rotation. Those are two different types of jobs. Now this job type could be a text. If you've been following along the application, that has become a drop down. And we needed to manage those drop downs. So this actually becomes an entity that will be managed in the system that will be used to reference or to define a type of job that has been entered in the system. So this becomes an entity as well. So orders, customers, place an order of one or more type of one or more jobs. So orders, customers place an order of one or more jobs. This is an additional entity to what we've been dealing with. Have you ever gone to a fast food restaurant like McDonald's and ordered more than one thing? So if I go to a garage to have worked on my car, I could ask them not only to change my oil, but also rotate the tires. Those are two different jobs that are completed on my vehicle. I'm the customer, but those two things need to be associated together. So I would go into the garage, place an order, and my order would include two jobs to be done on my one car. I'm the customer. One employee enters the order and perhaps those two different jobs are completed by two different technicians. So we have this orders entity that sort of ties all this stuff together. Now, after this system is in place and there's data being entered, there's process and work being tracked, any good system is going to have some reports that need to be defined and generated. So these reports could be on any of these entities or they could be an association of two or more entities together. Perhaps we want a report on a particular employee technician and we might wanna know what is their average amount of jobs completed within a day or within an hour. Perhaps I'm the garage owner and I want a report to know from the last month or the last year, what were the most profitable days, or weeks, months out of the year? There's all kinds of reports that can be defined and run on all this data. So I wanna lean back here and show all the entities that are on the whiteboard now. And this just about does it. These are all of the entities that have been defined for this project. But my experience, this is the very first step in gathering requirements. You get the stakeholders, you get the person, the users that you're writing this for, the who that we've defined. You just get them to talk about the system that they need to be built for them. And as you listen to them talk, as they bring up these things that you identify as entities that your system needs to manage, you need to pay close attention to those and start to ask more detailed information. Maybe not right there as soon as you learn of them, but as they describe the system and as you start to clarify different points of the application and they run out of words as they're describing the system, I'm gonna recommend that you show them the list of the entities that you've identified. This is very important. And once you're ready, you need to go through each of these and identify all the properties of that entity. Okay, so these are gonna be our columns, our fields for our database table. So more than likely, we're gonna have a database table set up for each of these entities here. Each one of them is gonna have a primary key. A lot of time that is some type of an auto number or identity field. A SharePoint list always has an ID field, starts off with one, and as you create a new record, it's gonna have two, three, four, that can be used as an ID. And those IDs, those primary keys become foreign keys in the other tables that reference that. Let's take a look at customers here. What type of information do we need to manage about customers? Why don't we need to keep track of their first, their last name, their address information, city, state, zip, their phone number, their email address, their contact information, any notes or comments that you want to keep track of for that customer. So as you define those things, 
you need to ask yourself, what is the type of data for this column, for each of these? Now, a lot of these columns, these fields will be just single line of text or in SQL Server, a Varchar. What if you wanna keep track of the birthday? Perhaps you wanna email them a coupon as their birthday's coming up to give them a free oil change. Well, you need to capture their birthday. Now, you don't wanna capture that as type string or text. You actually wanna capture that as a date field or a date time field. All right, let's talk about vehicles. What types of information will we need to capture about vehicles? Well, the year, the make, model. Well, the year would probably be a number. Now, year doesn't have to be a number. If you're not doing math with it, you could just keep it as a text. Make, model, color, all those could be text, single line of text, their tag, their license plate number being the tag, the VIN, V-I-N, vehicle information number, serial number of the car, any notes. So for each of these entities, you need to ask and confirm what each of them are and the nature of the data, the data type. So let's talk about common data types within a SharePoint list or a database system. Text, single line of text. Now you have multiple lines of text. So for comments or notes, you wanna use something like that, multiple lines of text. You have numbers, you might wanna ask yourself, are these whole numbers, are these fractions? Is it currency, date and time? Is it a Boolean type of field? Is it a yes, no, true, false? Is it some binary information? Is it, is it an image? Is it a document that needs to be uploaded and captured by the system? All right, so as you're gathering requirements, you're making a special note for all the entities that your system will manage. You're making a special note for all of the properties of each of these entities, which become columns or fields. Columns of fields have data types. Now there are relationships between these entities. So for example, a vehicle will have a column, something like customer ID. Now over here for customer, we probably have an ID, which is a number, an auto number. So their ID might be 1001. And then over here in vehicles, there's a customer ID that has 1001. So you know that vehicle belongs to this customer over here. So if you have an ID for another entity, then the entity that you're talking about, that's what's called a foreign key. And when you have a foreign key, typically the primary over here, the primary key, which is ID for customer, a lot of times you'll see a P, K, primary key. Over here, you'll see FK for a foreign key. And you'll say, oh, there's a relationship between these two. It's a one to many relationship. One customer can have multiple vehicles. So if you're over here on the foreign key, this is a customer ID, but this isn't a customer. You know, this is probably a foreign key. It's probably the many relationship. Over here, you have an ID and this ID is about customer. You could call this customer ID. I don't. A lot of times I just call my primary key ID. So if I see ID, I know that is the primary key for that entity. So a lot of times you have a primary key, foreign key. You've got a one to many relationship. You could have a one-to-one -one relationship. For example, if we're writing an application for a doctor's office that has multiple doctors or employees, well, we've got all kinds of different staff. Maybe it's a hospital. We've got all types of employees. Well, providers or physicians or doctors, they have a lot more information that we need to track. So we might have, I'll just say DR, an entity, and then it has a one-to-one -one relationship. And over here, we might have an employee ID that refers to an ID over here. Now, this would still be a primary key and this would still be a foreign key, but it would be a one-to-one -one relationship. Now, one-to-one -one relationships are a little less common. You want to make sure you're asking yourself a question. If you have a one-to-one -one relationship, with all these properties that you're defining over here, does it just need to be over here employees? Sort of like what we're doing with this garage application. So we have mechanics or technicians, and then we have office staff. Those are all managed here in the same entity. So a lot of times you don't have to define those one-to-one -one relationships. So while you're with your stakeholders, the person who's paying for the application, your users, you'd be asking a lot of questions, a lot of questions. Questions that make them like, oh, I didn't think of telling you that. Well, you need to ask them about these relationships. You're writing an application for a garage. You might assume, don't assume anything. I would pose your assumptions to your client, your customers. Customers can have more than one vehicle, right? They might come back and say, oh no, they'll always have one vehicle. But you need to ask those questions. You need to ask about the relationships between each of these. So whenever you're established these, these little relationships between these entities here, one order can have multiple jobs, right? There's a one to many relationship. One technician can work on more than one car. The garage system takes on more than one job in a day, right? So this is all good information to capture in the requirements gathering process. I would ask them what reports they're expecting to see out of the data that's all been managed in this application. As they start telling you about the reports, you might want to ask them specifically about each of these entities. Do you want any reports on your employees, on their productivity? Do you want to report to see if you mostly service cars or is 80% of the work 
brought into your garage, trucks, you won't know this information. You don't know what is important to a business owner or the running of that business. As developers, we come in and we just make a lot of assumptions. You can't leave anything up to assumptions because that will cost time and money. As we learn those assumptions were false later on. Find them out here, you can deal with them appropriately. You find them out later after you created the first version of the system or created the first screen and some really key information comes up that can drastically change how you design the application and add significant time and money spent on this project. That's what you want to avoid. With all these entities, what are the processes? What are the workflows that need to be defined? So you need to know. This is a garage. These customers come in with a vehicle. An office worker takes the information, creates an order, defines all the jobs that need to be attached to that order and attach each job to a technician for the work to be done. Is there any deviation from that process? Within all this process, going from screen to screen, are there any email notifications that need to be kicked off? Are there any approval workflows that need to be kicked off? Let's say uh, office admin, technicians, maybe you have a manager type of employee that actually needs to approve the order before it's actually submitted. Something else that we need to be thinking about are all the screens that we're going to create that are going to manage all these entities. What's the flow from screen to screen as they log in, as they go throughout the whole process and start the process over again, and even as they log off? What are all the screens? People who are on software developers, a lot of times they might think, oh, this is just a single single screen. It's simple. It's simple. You just, you just do this in a day. Maybe, but probably not. <laughs> so a job, like an oil change or AC repair, will have a type to do further describe a job that's going to be done on a car. There could be hundreds of job types. Do you want them to just type it in or does that need to be a drop down? As you're identifying all these entities, pay close attention. If somebody says, oh, this should be a drop down. Well, does that drop down? Is that just a, a status of a an employee? Active, inactive. If they've been separated from the organization, if they've been fired, they quit, you just need to set them inactive. Well, that's a pretty simple drop down. You make that a radio button or a checkbox, toggle button. But in the case of job type, you need to find out, okay, well, these types, are we talking about two or three? Are we talking about hundreds, dozens? So you get a better idea there. If it's just two or three, or maybe a maximum of five or six, I won't create a separate entity for that. I would create that as an enumerated value or just a simple array or record set within the application. But this job type is dozens or hundreds, and it might need to change, might need to be updated by office admin staff. You need to find that out now. <laughs> Special attention, you, you might want to talk about the screens. Open up a whiteboard in the conference room. Hopefully you're having this conversation in or perhaps it's a virtual conversation. You might want to share your screen, actually type up this information. Okay, well the first name, that's this can be text field, right? But when you get something like job type, are they gonna type that in or does that is that does that need to be a drop down? And that drop down, you need to ask those more questions. A drop down list or a combo box. Really dig into that. It's very important. That can really change a lot of things. So I do have a sample application that I did, it wasn't necessarily for a garage, but there were inspections done on vehicles. And that client came to me and said, oh, it's just this, we had this Excel spreadsheet and they just felt this information about the customer, the car, some initial information, and then there's a bunch of checklists down below in the spreadsheet. And in their mind, it was just a simple one screen application, but it actually ended up being a dozen screens. And we had a lot of the same entities, customers, cars. Instead of jobs, it was an inspection. Well, inspections had inspection questions, inspection answers, all kinds of stuff. So if anybody says drop down, or choice, really need to dig into that. So previously, we defined the project at a high level. This step, we've gathered the requirements. Then what is the next step? The next step is designing the system, designing the application. So there's a lot of things that need to be designed, such as the database, such as the screens. You need to design the reports. You need to design every aspect of the system before you open up Power Apps and start building the application. Sorry, there's a temptation just to jump in and do it. I don't recommend that you do that. Take your time during this process is gonna save you later on and it's gonna become more apparent the more projects that you work on, please. All right, so what did I miss out of gathering requirements? Please let me know in the comments below. Guys, for some reason, YouTube thinks you're gonna like this video next. Let's see if they're right. Or you can select this playlist, which I've selected for you based on the content you're currently watching. Guys, gotta hurry, click one of them. Otherwise, YouTube's gonna autoplay some other video, which you probably don't want. Thanks. <laughs>